Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining this workshop. We are very excited to be able to present to you. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll start with just like a quick introduction and maybe like let me tell you a little bit first what we're going to talk about. So basically, we want to introduce you to this major paradigm shift that's happening right now in the digital space, it's a move from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0. We would like to explain uh, its context and origins and also talk a little bit about this underlying technology uh, that's driving this shift, uh, which is the blockchain technology. So we all work in various projects that are trying to make this Web 3.0 a reality. And we, were, we met at various conferences as well. And we really wanted to work together to uh, present for you guys and introduce you to this big transition that's happening on the web right now. So let's make, start with like a quick round of introductions and we'll start with the presentation after that. Uh, Florian, do you wanna start? Sure, um, like an introduction? Yeah, just like tell Hi. Yeah, yourself. so I'm doing this talk together with um, Ola. I'm um, both a blockchain developer and a lawyer. And uh, this sounds crazy, but this is actually a new kind of thing uh, where um, blockchain, um, which is the technology driving the decentralized web, is touching upon many legal topics. And so it's actually interesting today um, to combine both legal and tech knowledge. And um, I'm the, the head of the um, German Blockchain Association which is an interest group that comprises all of the blockchain companies in Germany. And many of them are startups, most of them. And uh, together we try to influence German and international politics in order to pass new laws that will make um, the decentralized web a reality in, in Germany and the European Union and beyond. And I'm very excited to uh, talk to you guys today. And um, I'm giving it back to Ola to give you an introduction. Yeah, uh, perhaps we can also have Simona introduce yourself and sure. Yeah. Hi everyone, um, I'm Simona and I'm a co-founder of the Bounties Network. Um, we are a project built on the Ethereum blockchain and we focus on um, rewarding, incentivizing and organizing um, action through tasks um, across a whole variety of different verticals um, and with the ability to create and fulfill them from anywhere in the world. And I'm very excited to, to tell you a little bit more later. Scott, do you want to go? Awesome. Hey, I'm Scott. Um, I'm one of the members of Gitcoin, a project that's actually based on Bounties Network. Um, and we are focused on building a open source incentivization platform. The goal really is to try to get more developers working on open source projects and to sort of solve the maintainer sustainability problem, which I'll talk a bit more about during my, uh, my section. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks. And Gabrielle? Hi, Gaza Sky Geeks. Uh, my name is Gabrielle. And likewise, it's a true pleasure to be with you all today. I am a community member in the decentralized distributed tech ecosystem. I work mostly in advocacy and development and research and culture. Um, I come from a design background, um, have also taken part in some dev and programming workshops like you guys do, with JS Girls and Rails Girls, etc. And I love all things Web3. I won't be speaking much today, but I am your designated contact and follow-up person. So anything you need after our workshop, I am here for you guys. Thanks, Ola. Uh, all right, so let's start. And I think in order for us to understand and even start talking about Web 3.0, we have to also understand the context, the underlying context and how the web has evolved um, since the very beginning. So let's start with Web, web 1.0. What was that? That was like the first implementation of the web, which lasted from about 1985 to the year 2005. 
and it is considered a read-only web, which means that users, at least from like the end regular user's perspective, not a real developer perspective, could only search for information and read it. So there was very little interaction, very little space for user interaction and any type of content contribution. Uh, however, that was also the time of a truly free internet, maintained and built mostly on open source protocols. Um, later on, like with the emergence of Web 2.0, uh, we saw a huge cultural shift in how web pages were developed, uh, designed, and, and used. So we saw the rise of social media, um, including Facebook and Twitter, uh, various e-commerce platforms, as well as the rise of user-generated content. Uh, it, which means that people started contributing to blogs, wikis, video sharing sites like YouTube's, and so on. Uh, in that sense, the internet has become more mature and programmable, and it allowed like lots of people to enjoy peer-to-peer -peer interactions on a global scale. Uh, however, it only it, it always happened with intermediaries involved. So platforms were acting became to, started acting as trusted intermediaries between users who did not know or trust each other. And finally, with the shift that we're experiencing right now, uh, Web 3.0, um, this is so-called the decentralized web. So the idea is centered around bringing back those peer-to-peer -peer interactions without middlemen or intermediaries involved. And the blockchain technology, which we'll explain in detail later on, it's the driving force of Web 3.0. So let's provide a little bit more of historical context on that shift. Um, so between the eight, 1980s up to like mid 2000s or early 2000s, the dominant internet services were built on uh, open protocols that were controlled by the internet community. So one example is the domain name system, DNS, which is the underlying structure of uh, the internet that maps domain names uh, to the IP addresses. Uh, so it's like a crucial structure for the internet to exist and it was controlled by a distributed network of people and organization. At the very beginning, it was controlled by simply a community of volunteers. So anyone who you know, adhered to community standards and could own a domain, domain and establish uh, their internet presence back then. And in that sense, the power of actors operating the internet at that time was kept in check by, by the community. Uh, so with the onset of Web 2.0 uh, in early to mid 2000s, the control over the web has shifted from open source protocol maintained by those non-profit communities to proprietary services operated by large companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, and so on. And millions of users started migrating to those more sophisticated platforms. Um, so with, that sh with that shift of control, um, also their code base, you know, of, that these companies own became proprietary. And the governing principles were not anymore, you know, depending on the, on the community. They could change without making the users aware or asking for permission. Uh, so that shift uh, really marked, uh, had some big consequences for, for the users community uh, globally. And first of all, the creators and businesses that rely on those internet platforms became subject to all these rule changes that could, for example, take away their audiences and profits. And uh, the tech giants, so these huge firms um, monopolizing the internet, turned to economies of scale and network effects advantages. So they, they became de facto monopolies. Uh, they built vast records of transactions in our digital data, which in fact is we can, we can consider it as the more, most important currency in the world. And in controlling the, this, these records, um, we can say that they actually control us, the internet users. Uh, so the gravity of that problem became even more clear in early 2018, uh, when it was revealed that the political consulting firm Cambridge Analytica, uh, you might have heard of this story as well, had harvested the personal data of millions of people as Facebook profiles and without their consent and they use it for political purposes. So millions of users had, had their private data misused and stolen. 
in the case of Facebook, like this company is still struggling to deal with this fallout from, from the scandal, which affected uh, up to 87 million people and was linked to major political events, both the Brexit and Trump campaigns. Uh, the company has been forced to admit that it gathers ad data by tracking people around the web. So the, the failure of Facebook to foresee and take responsibility for these harmful effects um, of the global platform and the ways it can be abused, it placed like, historic levels of pressure on, on this company. And I would like to also just emphasize is that the case of Facebook is just an example and other tech giants also face backlash from the users community and regulators globally. Um, so that's that scandal that led to a greater public awareness um, of how you know a handful of large companies use technology to monitor and simply manipulate us. And it also led to serious debates over, for example, state sponsored bots and fake news which, as you probably know, are all these false sensational information disseminated under the guise of news reporting. Uh, fake news became mainstream during the US election in 2016 and still pose a problem now, as in the recent 2018 Brazil elections. And we also began to witness the dangers of algorithmic biases. So it turned out that algorithms are far from neutral and inherit our prejudices. And in the time, we also saw that policymakers worldwide get involved in, in the fight to, in this online privacy fight. So for example, the European Union introduced the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. It's a regulation that requires companies to protect the personal data and privacy of residents of the EU countries. And it forced really big changes on those big, huge tech companies. So, but still, you know, millions of people use Web 2.0 and various applications created in that time. And the internet works great, you might say. So what's even the point of building Web 3.0? And in fact, it's all about fundamental digital rights. Uh, so even the creator of the internet, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, um, is, is an avid supporter of the Web 3.0 movement. And he admitted that he always believed, you know, that the web is for everyone. Uh, but for all good we achieved, the web has evolved into an engine of inequity and division, swayed by powerful forces who use it to their own agendas. So he believes that, you know, a powerful change is necessary. Um, so what is the basic idea related to this question of fundamental digital rights? Um, it's all about the fact that the same type of human rights that we enjoy offline should also be enjoyed online. And the goal is to create what we have referred to a human-centric digital society. So it's about building a more trustworthy and secure digital services. It's also about having multiple profit centers sharing value across the, an open network, rather than concentrating power and data in the, huge of, in the hands of huge corporations with questionable motives. So that, so that the power will be returned to the original owners, the users. Uh, so decentralization um, is just an idea that grounds Web 3.0 and blockchain technology is basically the means to achieve, achieve this goal. Um, the vision for, for this fairer and more transparent internet dates back to around 2006. However, the tools and technologies, they weren't really available at that time for it to materialize. So Florian will explain you more in detail how it works. And I'll just introduce the high level innovative aspects of the blockchain technology and what it enables. And so first of all, uh, blockchain provides a new way for transferring and storing data without relying on a single entity or centralized server to guarantee that all of that functions properly. Which means that no one anymore has, an, has authority over your personal data. Um, moreover, like blockchain provides a new paradigm for deploying so-called dApps, decentralized applications, which are run by many users on a decentralized network. And they are designed to avoid any single point of failure. The, the nature of those dApps can be summed as distributed, flexible, and transparent. 
and those applications, like in whatever shape they will take, uh, will be aimed at disrupting many of those gatekeeping institutions and applications that currently dominate the centralized web. And they really have a potential to transform the technological landscape as we know it right now. Uh, blockchain is also said to be redefining trust in the digital economy. Because for, for the past decades, we have turned to intermediaries, platforms or institutions to provide trust and proof of transactions between counterparties. But thanks to the blockchain, uh, that's all changing right now. And instead of placing trust in corporations, we can place trust in community-owned and operated software, which is open source, and more on that also later on. And finally, we have the finest, famous cryptocurrencies, digital coins and tokens that are built into specific blockchains. And they can be seen as a tool or resource on a blockchain network. So those cryptocurrencies can have multiple purposes, and one of which is serving to incentivize individuals and groups to participate in, man maintain, and build services on the web. So I think like one of the most exciting aspects of the blockchain technology as it relates to Web 3.0 is its relations to open source software. Uh, it really has the potential to change, to change the game for uh, open source software development, without which the internet really wouldn't have existed. So as you might know, like developing this open source software is very challenging as it relies heavily on voluntary activity. And the contributors are not properly incentivized for their time and effort. Uh, and there is an ongoing search for sustainable open source models. So adding blockchain-based technology and cryptocurrencies to help open source projects grow and become self-sustaining in the long, long term. This technology can be applied to funding, claiming, and rewarding open source contributions. You can find out more about this uh, issue in the article that I linked below, and it's written actually by Scott's colleagues from Gitcoin, Kevin. So to sum up, um, Web3 is basically about bringing back an open blockchain enabled and community controlled internet. And that's what we are all excited about here. And Florian will dive deeper into the blockchain technology now for you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Ola. So I have the honor to try to explain um, a little bit to you what the blockchain is all about. Um, I will not go super in depth. Um, that will be subject of the course that we are offering um, on a weekly basis. Um, uh, I will talk about that a bit more in the end of my talk. Now I just want to give you a little overview. Um, so what you're seeing here on, on the screen is um, one of the attempts of um, a big magazine, The Economist, uh, to come up with an image of what a blockchain could look like. And um, here you can see this is, it was the cover image um, of The Economist in November 2015. And they had the challenge to, so they wanted to make an issue about blockchain and they had the challenge to come up with some picture for it. And as you can already see, it's really just a metaphor um, for what they call the trust machine. And, um, so what the blockchain does is it mechanizes trust, which sounds paradoxical because trust is something intimately human. You could say it's the relationships between humans and who you, who you have confidence in that they keep their promises. And the blockchain attempts to, to make that uh, digital, to, to put an algorithm behind this. And this is what makes blockchain so interesting. And it also tells us that blockchain is not just a technology. Blockchain is a socio-technical paradigm. So it combines social factors and technology into one innovation. And um, so since I'm a lawyer, um, I want to try to give a definition of what a blockchain is. Lawyers always need definitions, otherwise uh, they don't know what to do. So um, uh, in my definition, um, a blockchain is an immutable append-only database that records some information about the world 
And that database is being shared within a network of stakeholders. So people to whom this information is relevant that is being recorded in this database. And by having that database being shared and being immutable, um, uh, it means that people can agree on whatever is recorded in that database to be true to them. Okay, so in a way, a blockchain creates truth, which is interesting. Um, if we want to boil it down into really one sentence, we could say blockchains. So I'm using the plural here. There are many blockchains out there at this point. Blockchains turn data into facts through consensus computing. Okay. Um, so let's look at the kinds of blockchains that exist. As I told you, there are many blockchains out there. Blockchains being these databases where people record data or transactions, as we call it, in. And um, you can kind of nicely systematize the kinds of blockchains that are out there with this quadrant that I've drawn here on the sheet. And um, you've probably all heard about Bitcoin at some point in your life. And Bitcoin is famous because it was the very first blockchain in the world. Actually, Bitcoin invented the concept of the blockchain. And way before blockchain became a thing, people were crazy about Bitcoin. They were like, wow, there's now a new, a, a new form of money that doesn't need a bank. Um, and only years later, so Bitcoin was invented in 2008 and went live in 2009, only years later, like around 2012, people realized that the blockchain technology that enables Bitcoin is actually the bigger invention. It's bigger than just Bitcoin. And at that moment, it was like an explosion of ideas where many people in the world, entrepreneurs, developers, um, came up with new ways to build a blockchain that was different than Bitcoin, that had different values, different technological uh, parameters, and so on. But the original blockchain, Bitcoin, and some clones of Bitcoin, and then more evolved versions of a blockchain like Ethereum, they are all similar in the way that they are public databases, which means everybody can read and write to these databases. And they are permissionless, meaning that in, in such a system, there is no administrator, not a single person or actor or company that can unilaterally change data in that database. Every change and every, um, every access to that database that wants to modify or add some information needs to go through a consensus protocol where the whole network has to agree that this change is valid and according to the rules that this network has given itself. And so these are the most disruptive and most innovative forms of blockchains that we see out there. And they are the ones that we will be talking about in our developer course. Now, the banking industry has been very much caught by surprise by this development. The banks really didn't think that anybody would be able to challenge their position um, by being the sole you know, creators of money in the world. But in fact, this is what happened with Bitcoin and then all the following innovation. And so the banks looked at this new kind of money infrastructure, bookkeeping infrastructure, and thought, well, okay, maybe it's actually not that bad and maybe we can use it to become more digital and more innovative ourselves. So what they did in true developer fashion is they cloned the source code of these blockchains, especially Ethereum, and then put their own kind of governance model behind it. And now we have new forms of blockchains that are neither public nor permissionless. And that you see in the bottom right corner. Um, I, as an example, I used Hyperledger there and Monex, both companies that have at this point been bought or been bought up by IBM, um, the, the big computer company and services company, because they want to become the, the blockchain provider for banks and so on. 
So banks are running blockchains um, today, but they are doing, they are running these blockchains in a fashion that they are not publicly accessible. And there is, again, this notion of a centralized service provider or a consortium of private companies that collectively determine uh, who can write information to this database. So it's less disruptive and less innovative, but it still uses the same protocols as Bitcoin and, and, and similar blockchains. So there is some innovative character to it, but um, in terms of the disruptive effects on society, it tries to you know, go back to the model that we have today. And we will see which model wins out. And actually, there is even a third category of blockchains, which is somehow in the middle. Um, it's, it's blockchains that are run by, by, that are not permissionless. They are run by private consortia um, of companies, yet they want to be publicly accessible to everybody. And the reason they exist is because they want to, um, um, and a, they want to be compliant with laws. So let's say, for example, privacy laws, um, if you write something to blockchain and that blockchain can never be changed, it's a problem with privacy laws. Especially in Europe, we have a new kind of privacy law called the GDPR, the General Data Protection um, uh, Directive. And um, it, to be compliant with this law, you need to be able to remove um, personal data about people if they request it and they have a legal reason. And in a public blockchain like Bitcoin, that can never happen. Whatever is written in the Bitcoin blockchain is forever there. So these hybrid blockchains that are permissioned yet public, they're doing this mostly for legal reasons and compliance reasons, but they also do it for reasons of scalability. So they want to be able to, trend, to process more transactions at the same time um, and so on. So there are many different types of blockchains but they all use very similar protocols, which for us as developers means that whatever we build for one blockchain will also run on the other blockchain and the other blockchain. It's just a piece of software being executed in a different network yet on the same protocol. So, um, oh. um, to, yeah. So how does it look when you run a blockchain? Okay. So, um, these public and permissionless blockchains, um, they, they, they work in that way that you have a, a large group of people, people like us, that execute some software on their computer. And by collectively executing that software at the same point in time um, on the internet, um, it creates a, a sub-network that can be considered a universal trust infrastructure um, that can be compared to, to our notion of a public good, like the sea and the air and so on, stuff that is owned by nobody, but that can be used by everybody. So there's a utility to it, which is interesting. And um, in private and permission networks, where the banks are the, 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 the entities running the network, um, it's more like an inter-organizational trust infrastructure that allows these companies to um, interact more efficiently, but there is no universal character to it. It's more private. Um, and to close, to close off this general introduction, um, what, is, what is the paradigm shift that blockchain brings about? So um, what you can see here on the screen is um, what we call a network topology. So it describes how nodes in a network um, like you and me right now having this um, remote um, video call, um, how we connect to one another. And every IT infrastructure, including the one that we are using right now to interact, is based on this centralized network topology that you see on the left. So you can see that every node is connected with every other node through a centralized service in the middle. And the problem here is obviously that this centralized service in the middle can censor us, they can profile us, and they can monetize us. And what blockchain allows us to do is to migrate this centralized IT infrastructure to a more decentralized infrastructure where there is no centralized middleman controlling our interactions. 
The mind-blowing thing about this is, however, that on our bookkeeping infrastructure level, where we actually exist already in a decentralized world, meaning every company, every private person keeps their own books, and we have a whole industry of lawyers like me, and bookkeepers, and auditors, and courts, and judges, and so on, to make sure that the books of company A and the books of company B are synchronized, that whole infrastructure can fall away because we're now all writing and looking into the same book. So on a bookkeeping level, blockchains centralize our society by being able to decentralize the underlying IT infrastructure and having a more trustworthy infrastructure. So this is the paradigm shift. We decentralize on the infrastructure level and we centralize on the bookkeeping level. Okay. Um, so I think I've been told to speed up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's look at so um, let's look at this tech stack, um, um, and and I will close it off after that. So what a blockchain is not a monolithic piece of software. Okay. It is rather um, a stack of technologies built on top of each other. And uh, you read this from the bottom up. It starts with the internet. Every blockchain is connected through the internet and it uses the TCP IP protocol family. Based on the TCP IP protocol, a blockchain uses peer-to-peer -peer protocols, gossip protocols to create subnetworks within the wider internet. Now within these subnetworks, there is a so-called consensus protocol. And this consensus protocol is the true innovation of blockchain, okay? This consensus protocol makes sure that although we do not have a centralized service provider anymore that ensures that everybody is looking at the same data, um, there is still this notion of a single point of truth in the network, a single unified data store that everybody is looking at and that is identical to everybody. This is the consensus protocol and this is where the core governance of the network happens. This is, this is the innovation. This is what um, the Bitcoin came up with that everybody blew everybody's mind because they, they didn't even know that this was possible. And so what a blockchain is, when we talk about a blockchain in a colloquial manner, what we're talking about is actually the fourth layer on top of these three protocols, TCP, IP, peer-to-peer, -peer, and consensus protocol, the fourth layer, which is this asset registry, okay? It's this database that emerges out of these three underlying layers working together. And on this fourth layer, the blockchain database, we register assets like Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies. This is where, where we keep the books about them. And interestingly, there is a fifth layer which I call the relationship layer. And this is where we can automate these, um, these transfers of assets between parties. In the blockchain world, we call that smart contracts. And smart contracts are really computer programs that have sort of an autonomous existence within a blockchain network, and they can autonomously modify this asset registry that we call the blockchain. And this is why smart contracts are interesting. Smart contracts are a piece of code that exists in a blockchain and they, they can hold their own cryptocurrency and they can send that around, they can store it and there can be complex governance rules around who can access these funds locked within these smart contracts. Um, uh, the, the, these tokens, the cryptocurrencies that we all know, the Bitcoin and so on, they can represent many different things, okay? So you can use the blockchain to, for, as a bookkeeping tool for many different things. So there are companies, startups, that, that want to represent physical objects on the blockchain, okay? Um, so maybe when you rent a car in the future, that car will have an identity on the blockchain and it could be represented as a token. So by sending around the token, you can change the owner of the car. The same for your house, house and, and whatever else you can think of. Um, then uh, tokens can represent virtual things in computer games, for example. Many people believe that the computer gaming industry will be the first industry to properly adopt blockchain technology in a mainstream fashion. 
Okay, for example, there are people that build versions of Minecraft, a computer game you, you all probably know, where the objects in Minecraft are actually represented as tokens on a blockchain. The advantage is that by doing this, you can for the first time actually own an object in a computer game because you are the owner of the token that represents that thing in the computer game. And lastly, and this is something that uh, many people are crazy about as well, is you can represent legal, legal, legal rights uh, as token on a blockchain. And that allows you, for example, to do, to do finance on the blockchain. Okay, so imagine that in the future, when you build a successful startup and you want to do an IPO, an initial public offering, and raise money from the public to finance the, the operations of your company, you do not go to a stock exchange, but you actually um, tokenize, you represent the shares in your company as token on the blockchain, and you sell them, just like cryptocurrencies, but people buying it become actually co-owners of your company. So this is what many people are working on. But at the same time, for example, if you think about copyright, like license agreements, imagine that music can be represented as token on the blockchain. And, um, you know, as an artist, you can, um, you, can um, you know, put the license of your music on the blockchain and, and people can more easily find out who is the owner of a piece of music or a movie and so on. All of this is happening right now. Startups are building that stuff. Um, there are many different kinds of tokens out there. There is the Bitcoin kind of token, which is a payment token. It's used for transferring money. There are utility tokens like Ether, which are being used to execute smart contracts. There are app tokens to use, um, to use apps. There are these security tokens that represent financial instruments. There are asset tokens that can represent real life assets. So there's a whole family now, a whole zoo of, of, of different tokens which are being created today. Smart contracts, I've been talking about it. It's these autonomous programs that sit on top of the blockchain and can autonomously um, modify this asset registry and do interesting stuff there. And um, you can think about smart contracts like a vending machine um, in the sense that a smart contract represents the transactional logic um, of an agreement between people. So a smart contract is not really a legal contract in that sense. It's more like a vending machine that represents a purchase agreement. Um, and a smart contract can also represent the transactional logic of a purchase agreement, for example, but many other things as well. Like, for example, you can do escrow contracts um, through the blockchain. You can do these kinds of token contracts. So if you look at this, for example, these are 23 lines of code. And this is the most popular smart contract in the world. It creates a so-called token. And that token can represent all kinds of things. It can represent an object in a computer game. It can represent a currency like the US dollar. And it's being used for all that, all that stuff. And you can see these are 23 lines of code and it's extremely powerful. And in the, in the blockchain course that we will be live streaming in the future, um, we will learn how to write that kind of code, okay? It's um, quite, so it, it looks quite simple and it is actually quite simple to write. It's just very difficult not to make mistakes that will cost you millions of dollars, okay? So <laughs> it's, uh, it's an interesting challenge. Um, so, yeah, I think I will be skipping these slides. Um, I have some more interesting stuff um, um, to tell you, but we will all do this in the course. Um, just know that blockchain has become a global phenomenon. There are thousands of people in the world working on it beyond the borders. This is just here, the German blockchain community. We have maybe a hundred companies in Germany working on this stuff. Um, um, yeah, and there are many interesting challenges and maybe the biggest challenge of all is to bridge this gap between the blockchain world and, and the real world, right? In many different ways. So our biggest challenge today from the point of the blockchain community is to drive major adoption of this technology in the world. So we want to get as many people as possible 
to get enthusiastic about this technology, to start learning how to use it, to develop software with it. And if, if we all, if enough people do this, we can actually change the world and kind of, you know, get back the power to the people and take it away from the corporations. And this is kind of the idealistic goal behind this. And um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, my contribution to this. Um, just very quickly, so um, the blockchain course that we're offering is two hours per week. It's every Tuesday from 7 to 9 p.m. European Central Time. And we will live stream it here from this office, from the Blockchain Embassy in Berlin. And we're working in cooperation with Ready School. Ready School is a, um, a, a place um, that teaches refugees that have ended up in Berlin for whichever reason um, to, to learn uh, um, um, software development. And we are one provider of, 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 of such a development course in the school. And students um, voluntarily choose to learn maybe Java development or C Sharp or maybe blockchain development. And we have a new course starting, when does the new course start? 21st of January, right? So, 21st, so 20, 22nd of January, we will have the first course. And we're inviting all of you to join the live stream and to learn blockchain development with us. We have done one such course last year. It was a big success. We had 15 students, they all loved it. And now we're very happy to be able to cooperate uh, with you guys and to be able to live stream the course right um, to you. And we will have many different teachers here from Berlin, uh, successful blockchain entrepreneurs uh, and developers, and they will teach you how to do a uh, blockchain development. This is the lesson plan. Um, I will be sharing all of this with you afterwards. Uh, you will basically learn how to build smart contracts properly. Like it will be an in-depth developer course it will be challenging, but it will be worth it because afterwards you have amazing skills. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. And I think now it's Scott's turn. Or actually, yeah, it's Simona's oh, turn. Oh, Simona's yeah. turn, sorry. Cool. And we'll share information about that course later on with you as well per email. So stay tuned for that. Cool. Do you want to start, Simona? Yes. Awesome. So thank you so much, guys. That was um, very, very insightful. And I thought very well kind of um, presented to ease us in. And I think one of the main um, goals that we have in the Bounties Network, um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're one of the projects, one of the applications that are built on top of the Ethereum blockchain, is to really lower that entry level and lower the... the um, complexity that comes with getting involved with a blockchain application. And I think that for a lot of people, particularly coming into the space, has been a little bit daunting, a little bit um, challenging in terms of not necessarily having a starting point or an angle to get you into what uh, a blockchain built application looks like. So what we're doing with the Bounties Network, um, to give you a little bit of background, we created the Standard Bounties Protocol um, in 2017 and then launched to the Ethereum mainnet um, at the end of 2017, so in October 2017. We also created an explorer on top of that protocol. And as Scott mentioned, Gitcoin also sits on top of the um, standard bounties protocol as a vertical for open source. What our explorer does is really broaden the um, types of projects that we um, support and the type of work that we have on the Explorer to really look at, um, you know, people from all kind of aspects of their interests, their personalities, their skills, and again, have that level of beginner, intermediate and advanced, but across um, a whole range of, of different skill sets like um, development, but also design or art or music or research. So really looking at what people are interested in and what they can contribute in from a, a much broader perspective. 
Um, and then Ola, if you want to click next for me, please. On the next slide. So essentially with, um, with our, our um, application, you're looking at incentivizing and organizing action. What that essentially means is that you create projects or tasks that then have a reward at the end for somebody completing that particular task. And so this changing the incentives, changing the world was actually a quote by um, Vitalik Buterin, who is the, the inventor of the Ethereum blockchain. And he was looking at this from the perspective of if you incentivize people to do things, will the positive actions that they do increase? Or will you be able to really engage people on a global level versus, like Florian said, from a very kind of centralized um, company perspective? Then if we move to the next one, I think that's just the quote and then we can skip to the next. So that's basically. So just to give a little bit of a definition of what a bounty is, it is essentially a reward offered by an individual or an organization to accomplish a specific task. And as I was mentioning, and as Florian pointed out, the bounty is actually a smart contract. What that means is that it is a task that's created by, again, an individual or an organization for a specific task, and whomever fulfills it gets the reward. There are a whole range of different bounties. You have bounties specific to development, which is what Gitcoin focuses on. Um, you have bounties for translations. We do a lot of that, and I'm um, hoping that that will also um, diversify and increase as we broaden the reach to um, other um, groups like um, you guys, like people in, in several different countries who would want to look at um, education or at resources in their, in their native um, languages. Research, again, is, is very, very um, popular where, um, again, organizations or um, individuals want to run polls or surveys that can have a, a global reach. Um, design is another um, very um, important one, as is content creation. So that's just setting up what a bounty is. And then if we move to the next one, it's basically what this ha what this means is through these bounties, you are essentially um, introducing the concept that blind trust is no longer the the way to to run things, but proof of action is. And what that means is every single bounty requires you to deliver something, a proof of an action or a deliverable. So, for instance, in the um, example of design, you would deliver a website or a logo or an illustration for something like a social impact, for instance, um, bounty, which I'm going to touch on um, in, in a bit, you are essentially recording a proof of your action and based on that proof, you are getting your reward. Now, the reason why these are a, a huge step forward from what we traditionally have in terms of projects or task fulfillment is that the funds that are used for the payment of that reward within the bounties, within the smart contracts, are sitting, is sitting in the smart contract. It doesn't sit with me, even if I created the bounty, and it doesn't sit with a specific organization who controls those funds. What that means is that the transparency level of those funds going from the bounty to the recipient are always traceable. Like we said before, they are unchangeable. So somebody could not, you know, go in there and, and change that transaction or divert it. So you are having a whole layer of um, transparency that was never there before. So this is why I'm saying that blind trust, you know, hoping that you're going to get paid or hoping that everything is going to be um, the, the flow of funds will go from A to B. You no longer have to trust it. It is, it is there encoded in, in that particular contract. So then if we move a little bit further, what that means from a global project perspective and also from a specific bounty per bounty perspective means that anybody can contribute to a bounty. So funds can be 
crowdsourced from all over the world. And again, when you get the funds in, they go into the smart contract, into the bounty versus to a particular individual or to a particular organization. The data is a lot more secure than what we're seeing. And again, Florian touched on a lot of this before. You have rapid access uh, and response because again, we have this decentralized database that is accessible from anywhere, right? So it doesn't live on a specific computer owned by a specific organization or a specific individual. You have these instant payments. So when a submission abides by the requirements of that smart contract, as soon as the submission is approved, the funds in ETH or any token on Ethereum right now, because like I said, we are sitting on top of the Ethereum blockchain, those funds will go immediately to the, the successful fulfiller. And then a long-term revenue stream, that is potentially something that we can build out based on a um, combining this freelance way of working and more and more projects moving towards outsourcing a lot of the tasks and decentralizing their, their operations. And so if we move a little bit further. Now, it's all about easy access. And this has been one of the key problems that we have had with blockchain. It's this access, is how do you go about tapping into everything that we have built and, and being able to, in fact, build your own applications or work with the ones that are already live or, or are um, uh, being developed as we speak. And what this means is if we move to the next one. So in terms of simplification, the reason why bounties are so powerful and certainly um, the way we've been using them in terms of a broad reach and a broad level of um, access from very, very beginner to intermediate to um, advanced is that you're actually making it very, very simple. You create a task, somebody fulfills it, they get a reward. And so what we can do with that is create a whole host of different applications for this very simple format that can enable people to, for instance, earn as they learn, they enable them to interact with decentralized applications as they are learning and as they are um, accumulating that knowledge and moving through their journey um, to their journey of, of getting to know blockchain and even potentially developing um, on top of blockchains. So we move even th further. Now, one of the things that we have done because like I mentioned, we were um, live on mainnet since we've been live since 2017 is actually we've been able to gather a lot of feedback from a lot of people, most of them with very, very either no knowledge of blockchain or certainly not in depth knowledge and maybe not even technical backgrounds. And so what that has meant is one of the main feedbacks, um, the, the kind of uh, pattern of feedback that we were receiving is that it would be nice to be able to access the, the bounties network on mobile, which is something that a lot of applications are very much stuck to desktop. And we decided to move it and make it fully responsive to be um, accessed on mobile because there are a lot of things that you would want to do, same as you're doing right now on the go or being able to um, work on something or interact with something or digest some information, not necessarily sitting at your computer. And so we, when we redesigned the Explorer, which was um, at the, uh, in September last year, we decided to completely overhaul it and make it a lot more in line with what everybody is used to when they think of an application, of an online application. And so if we move even, even further, this is essentially what our Explorer looks like. And I, I did choose, um, you had the, the mobile view before, but this is what um, the desktop looks like. And so what you can see straight, straight off the bat is that you have a whole range of different tasks over there. You have research, you have um, refer a friend um, for, for a job opening, you have a design bounty, you have uh, research bounties, and really all of these and the variety um, that this brings is that you can get started without having to be proficient in a particular skill set or in a particular um, technically driven um, uh, educational 
education background. The reason for that is, again, as we get more and more people into um, the blockchain space and into the Web3 world, building with us, growing it so that the reach and the usage of Web3 applications grows, is that we want everybody to feel welcome. We want everybody to feel that they can participate. And you may have heard of this term Biddle, which stemmed from, from a misspelling of the word build. It's, it's kind of been um, associated with development and developers, but actually everybody can build. Everybody can get involved. And for potentially for the first time in a very, very long time, if ever, we can all look at having a seat at that table and having a, um, a way into participating in this global economy, in a global community, um, if you will, with all of our skills and with all of our interests as well. And if we move um, one step further, I'm gonna give you this example, for instance, because I mentioned the interest and, and the passions of people. So we created this Bounties for the Oceans bounty, which is still live, um, and, and I would urge you to, to go and fulfill it. It's essentially a social impact bounty that we created in um, uh, May last year, and the, the idea with it was that we were going to flip the whole model of how, for instance, charities work or environmental um, initiatives work. And instead of one organization asking people for money and then going back to that blind trust, asking people to trust them that they're going to use the money however they say they're going to use use them, we are going to flip it and actually reward people for their individual positive actions. So this particular bounty asks um, anybody, anywhere, to go and perform a cleanup, whether it's on a beach, on a street, in a park, wherever it may be, and submit verifiable proof of that cleanup very rustic it's a photo with a date stamp and you with the trash that you have gathered and when i created that bounty and so when i get notified of um uh, a new submission i go check that it abides by the requirements of my smart contract and as soon as i approve it you um the um the person who submitted gets uh 10 die now, die is a stable coin. What that means is just one die will always be one dollar. So it doesn't go through the whole fluctuations that we have seen with a lot of the cryptocurrencies. And you may have heard of all the dizzying highs and lowest lows. And so that's one example that taps into not necessarily a skill set, but something that maybe people are passionate about, which is improving the health of, of our planet. And so if we move one further, um, again, this was a, a pilot that we did in Manila in the Philippines just to see what it would look like with a community of people. And we had 220 people turn up at our cleanup and it was in at the beginning of December. And we really went through what it is like to get set up with um, a wallet, which we will have more information on. I think we'll be able to share all of this material just to go through a getting started guide of what it is like to set up a crypto wallet um, and what it is like to um, sign up and, and fulfill something. So we went through all of those motions, which I believe should be something that we go through at a regional level to make sure that everything is in line with the tools that are available in a particular region and of course what can be done in a in a particular location and so if we move um further one before so one of the main things um so what you can do and then we can skip to the next one is I have this bounty that's set up, which is actually a synopsis and takeaways from blockchain events around the world. Now, when I say events, they could be anything. They could be this particular workshop. And so if there is anything that you have written down, if there's anything that you feel was a particularly important piece of information that you got out of this, or if it's something that you didn't know and you found out, or it's something that has, will drive you to do X, Y, Z, this 
for instance, is a bounty that asks you for that takeaway. And what you can do is you contribute to it. You let me know whether it's a photo, whether it's text, whether it's a video, whatever you want to do, submitting to that bounty and you will get the reward once I accept the submission. So this is a practical thing that you can do just to go through the mechanics of what it feels like and what it is like to um, fulfill a bounty. Again, not uh, without any kind of um, uh, skill requirements or any kind of in-depth knowledge of what blockchain is. So I would urge everybody who's, who's here today to, to fulfill this if you felt that this was um, particularly valuable. And then um, the next one is just a set of um, getting started. You can see our getting started guide, which basically takes you through the steps of setting up a wallet. You can um, check out our Explorer, see what other projects we're working on. And of course, join our community for any kind of help or any kind of questions or um, sharing some music choices. You know, it's, it's all about whatever, um, you know, anybody wants to, to get involved with. Um, I think it's, it's, this is the time and I think it's, it's an important um, thing that we're, we're moving towards and I'm excited. So thank you. Cool, great. Thank you, Simona. Uh, so yeah, now we'll move to the last presentation by Scott and we'll answer your questions afterwards and also share all the materials as well. Awesome. Thanks so much so far, guys. Um, great presentations. Um, so, as Simona mentioned, uh, Gitcoin is a platform uh, built on top of Bounties Network focused on trying to grow open source and improve maintainer sustainability within the broader sort of Web3 and uh, open source ecosystems. So, uh, if we flip to the next slide. Um, before I get started, the one thing I do have to do is just, you know, thank sort of three major organizations within the Web3 space that have sort of given us support. Um, one is Consensus, uh, which is sort of a large venture studio uh, accelerator within the Web3 ecosystem in Ethereum specifically, uh, the Ethereum Foundation, and the Ethereum Community Fund. Um, so thanks to all of them for their support. So essentially, um, the way that our platform works is quite similar to uh, how Bounties Network works, given that we, we base sort of our technology on their smart contracts. So effectively, we um, allow you to take any GitHub issue um, and fund that issue in any ERC20 token, which is just any token that is um, on the Ethereum network. Um, and then we can basically validate the results um, and uh, the coder will submit a pull request, and then that pull request will be paid out in those ERC20 tokens once the task is complete. And so this is a really easy way to sort of bootstrap a network of coders that are actively working on improving open source projects that are relevant to their interests and that are relevant to um, larger projects in the space that need particular tasks done. So it's sort of a double-sided marketplace where we're matching funders and coders in order to overall improve the sustainability of open source. And one of the reasons, switching to the next slide, that that's sort of important is if you look historically, um, there's been a huge explosion in open source. Um, in 2001, there were approximately 200,000 or so users of um, SourceForge. Um, and then today there are about 31 million users of, of GitHub. That's a pretty substantial difference. So for, for us, we're realizing that, you know, and, and actually if we just switch to the next slide, you know, another just very quick um, sort of examples that uh, in terms of, uh, downloads, there were about 180,000 downloads of Netscape in 1998, and now, you know, about 20 years apart, uh, Lodash, which is one of the most popular uh, Node.js uh, dependencies, um, I realize this isn't necessarily an Apple's, Apple's comparison, has about a million uh, downloads. So again, it's a huge order of magnitude difference. Um, uh, switching to the next slide. Um, the issue is effectively, though, that, that this huge growth study um, from a, um, I believe, a, a Japanese publication, um, which defines sort of the roughly um, one to two developers that are given open source project tasks on average. Um, and this is a huge issue because 
um, you know, define how the work is, is going to be done, um, that put in most of the time on coding and uh, reviewing PRs and reviewing code. Um, and without maintainers, it's very hard to manage like a, an open source project. So the challenge there is effectively, you know, we have this disconnect. We have a huge growth in interest in open source, uh, but we don't have really any growth in the people that are maintaining that. Um, and switching to the next slide. One of the reasons for this is, you know, there's not really any funding for maintainers. So um, you can see from this about 60% or so of maintainers are not really, uh, not really funded at all. Um, the remainder, by vast majority, are only just funded by their employer to maybe spend 10 to 20% of their time on a given open source repository. Um, and so this doesn't really provide, you know, sustainable developer hours to open source. It, it's sort of just a, a band-aid of sorts. And we think that that's something that really needs to change. Uh, switching to the next slide. And so one of the problems here, oh, there's one more just before that, but these are just some, like, some examples of sort of why this is a problem when you only have one to two maintainers per project. Um, if we just move back one slide. Yeah, so um, essentially, you know, there's, um, there's a few different examples of burnout here. So in one hand, um, we have actually uh, the founder of a project called Semantic UI, which was sort of a similar project to React or to VJS. These are front-end frameworks um, that people use to um, build, you know, any kind of application, not necessarily a Web3 application. Um, and, you know, they got burned out because they just didn't have any time to maintain their application and weren't getting any support. Um, what they essentially wrote was um, that after three years of trying to make OS work um, with part-time proprietary work, um, they couldn't think of any way to uh, continue the project. Um, the second one was essentially with a project called OpenSSL, which was uh, started in 1998 by a group of security researchers in the UK. Effectively, they were very interested in, you know, continuing this project and actually spent the vast majority of their time on it uh, until they couldn't uh, because they just didn't have any funding. And then this last example uh, is from actually a, a more recent example from Dominic Tarr, who effectively uh, had maintained a, uh, a very core uh, library in NPM uh, in the Node ecosystem again called uh, EventStream. And uh, effectively, this is his post about not really getting any support or any um, you know real um, uh, validation or um, uh, interest from the community in his work on event stream. Eventually this led to him sort of giving control of that to someone who uh, it turned out, uh, you know, maliciously inserted code into the library and um, which in turn caused uh, quite a few issues for the users um, of which there are many since it's very highly dependent upon. Um, there was a similar story with OpenSSL in which effectively um, Heartbleed, which was uh, quite a large vulnerability um, caused somewhere in the range of you know, I think it was in the range of probably billions of dollars of damage at the time. Um, the point is, though, that, you know, all these examples of burnout um, don't just have sort of uh, moral implications. They also have real financial implications. And so we need to be um, sort of considerate of that in how we uh, fund open source. Uh, next slide. Uh, there should be one just before that. So um, essentially our solution to this is to kind of create this flow from users to contributors to maintainers. And so we talked before about there, there being this marketplace of funders and coders. Effectively, the bounties product that we have is mostly geared towards getting users to become contributors. People that are either, you know, making a few pull requests every, every month, um, but aren't necessarily active members or as active as they could be members of the open source community, trying to get those people really um, more engaged um, or you know, people who have never contributed to open source, getting those people to contribute for the first time and really be active. Even if they're already experienced coders, there are plenty of people within the software community that just have never really thought to do any work in open source, um, but are very talented. Um, and then on this other part, we really want to get contributors to become maintainers, people that are actually submitting a lot of code. We want those people to start to review code. We want those people to start to be actively involved in the 
project management that goes um, into building an open source project. And so this is sort of the next step for us um, as we look at other products um, within sort of our, our um, product suite, I guess I'll call it. Um, so if we switch to the next slide, we sort of have, I guess, four main projects right now that we're working on. So we have the bounties product, we have badges, which are sort of a way to ensure that uh, people are incentivized, not just from um, a monetary reward, but also intrinsically for their, their contributions. So badges or kudos are sort of a way to give someone just a genuine compliment for their work um, and add that to the payment or sort of to the, um, the transaction that you're, you're providing on the platform. Um, the goal there is, is again, really just that, you know, we all have our own intrinsic motivations and we all have working relationships with people um, within our communities. And really, you know, we're trying to scale up this global community of developers. And so we want to sort of create that feeling of um, connection with people that um, are, are, you know, are working with you. Um, this is something that I think is, is fundamental to getting people to provide like to, to create real, like strong working relationships. Um, we also have grants. So, so grants is the one thing I really want to hit home in terms of this contributor to maintain a relationship. So the way that that sort of is, is working is we, we allow you to take any uh, bounty um, and any bounty hunter that you work with, and you can effectively provide them a subscription payment on a monthly basis to do continuous work with you in the future. And so right now we've actually launched, um, I probably should have put a link to this, but like we've launched gitcoin.co slash grants. And effectively, this is mostly working with the Web3 community right now. But the goal is to really um, uh, get more of these projects, um, these maintainers paid for their work, and to get people um, from our community to work with them on certain key tasks. So for example, we're working with the Ethereum Foundation on fuzz testing for Constantinople. Uh, one of the core members of the Gitcoin community um, agreed to go and do some work with them and is getting a monthly stipend uh, from the platform in order to do that. And this is sort of, again, we think really critical because um, the one-off payments are, we think, really important for getting people engaged and getting people to be continuous contributors. Um, but we also want to make that next step towards people uh, becoming maintainers. Um, so if we just go to the next slide. Uh, one more. Or Oh, it, uh, sorry, the previous one just didn't show. Um, so this is just our world map. Um, I've sort of talked about a few of these um, pieces already. Really, our mission is to grow and sustain open source. We're really looking to have a common brand and team and strategy around that. Um, and we have sort of a, a few different projects, products to do that. Um, the one I haven't mentioned yet, which I wanted to really mention here, is actually CodeFund. So um, CodeFund is an ethical advertising platform that we um, have actually helped run since, I guess, maybe uh, early last year, I think January or February, maybe. Um, and effectively, the goal of it is to allow developers to advertise to other developers on websites like JSBin or Material UI or other large sort of developer focused websites. And this is sort of a um, project that comes from Eric Berry. And Eric Berry has been in the open source community for a long time and has sort of seen this problem emerge where developers really just aren't um, necessarily uh, getting uh, enough value to continue doing open source work. And this was sort of his solution to that problem. We thought it fit really well into our vision and into sort of our overall goals. And so we um, we're really happy to have his, his project um, with us. Uh, one final slide. Awesome. And so to date, we've done about um, you know, close to 750,000 for the platform. Um, a lot of that just in, in January, actually. And we have, you know, some rough developer stats on, or, or I should say like platform stats. So um, we're trying to keep track of, you know, how we're doing and like, you know, everyone on the platform that we work with, we want to be very, very um, close with so we can understand exactly where their pain points are and exactly where we can improve. And, um, you know, if you guys decide to use the platform, we would really highly value your feedback as well. Um, anything that you could tell us about ways that we can improve or um, ways that you would want to use it that you can't currently would be super helpful. Um, in, in short, we, you know, try and pay people between uh, 20 to 62 and like the two standard deviations um, of that's like probably the, 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 the major portion of 
per payment um, lies, but we also have people outside those ranges, what I'm trying to say. So like, um, we, we typically have people above 20 because we're looking to set a sort of minimum bar for the total um, that someone uh, can be paid. We don't want people to be paid like the same sort of wages that they might be paid on something like Upwork. We want it to be very much like a sustainable wage. Um, and then 62 is sort of the higher end, but like we actually go quite a bit beyond that in some bounties, especially with uh, things like Rust that are uh, more niche and not necessarily as um, active. So, you know, I would say 62 goes probably, you know, maybe, maybe we go up to like 80 or 90 in like the very highest range. Um, and we also have about 20,000 monthly active users. Uh, we've, yeah, we have a few stats about like the average start time, uh, you know, about six hours and the average turnaround time about um, sort of 10 days. And uh, most importantly, I think, um, is just the number of people that are being hired full time through the platform. So, you know, this goes back to the point about um, sustainability. We, we want people to uh, be able to make open source work um, their full time job. Those 16 people have been hired full time by projects that are entirely open source, and we're really happy to hear that. Um, next slide. And so, again, I really encourage you guys to reach out if you have any questions about the platform. Um, essentially, like, you know, some of the things that people ask quite a bit are, you know, how do I fund an issue, or what makes a good bounty, um, or how should I price my bounty? And similarly, like, you know, how do I find projects to work on? How do I find different um, tools or um, different, you know, projects that would interest me? Um, I think the Explorer is a great place to start for that. But again, feel free to reach out directly if you guys um, want me to sort of walk you through or, or help you find individual um, individual projects to work on. And if you're looking for funding for projects that you're already working on, we actually have two great ways to do that. Um, one of them I mentioned, which is grants, but we also have gitcoin.co slash requests, which is essentially a way for you to go and request a bounty on any particular GitHub issue that you already have in your repository. So this is a really easy way for you to get started and sort of start using the platform for funding your work. Um, if you want to make a request, please go there. Please just essentially paste in the GitHub issue and we will fund it for you. Um, so I think that covers it for me. Um, Thanks again, guys. Um, and uh, if we have time at the end, maybe I'll do a demo, but I don't want to necessarily uh, take up too much time now. Um, so thanks again, guys. Thank you. All right, so we're done with the presentations part now. And I know it was a lot of information from so many different areas of kind of the Web3 world. Um, so, I don't know, Dalia, like, should we, if you guys have any questions already, we can, I guess, take them or otherwise we can also just follow up after. And we'll, you know, share this, we'll have this presentation recorded so that everyone can go through it again and kind of take their time to understand what this is all about. Um, yeah. We're also going to forward this deck too, right, Ola, so that it can be distributed and the links and contents and the resources will also be available to everyone as well. Yes, 